All right, delighted to be joined by the professional Irish cyclist Imogen Cotter. Imogen, how are things? Very good. Happy to be here today um, in Dublin, launching the ad campaign with Skoda and RSA. So, yeah, nice to be home. I can imagine, and it's, I know it's a whistle stop tour for you, as these things tend to be. But um, you're you're here for good reason, and you've been picked as an ambassador for for good reason by the RSA and by Skoda Ireland because you have had a mad year, year and a bit. Um, a lot of people will be familiar with your story, but I guess. For those who aren't, maybe tell us what happened on, on January 26th of, of last year. So January 26th of last year, um, I suppose up until that point, I kind of have to tell like the backstory because I think what makes uh, the story a story is like I had had like a really long road to get to where I was. I had been, uh, I was, I had just signed my first professional contract. So up until that point, I'd been really trying. I had been working in Belgium. I moved there. I didn't know the language. I, um, you know, I just really wanted to make this happen. And I, I had signed my first professional contract, and I just won the national champ. So you know, in cycling, you get to wear a, a special jersey all year. Um, <clears throat> so it was like everything was coming together. I just moved country. I had moved to Girona. It was like, you know all looking rosy and then 26th of January I was out on a bike ride and I had done testing that week um all of my power numbers were up you know I had a big racing calendar ahead and just like 10 minutes from home I was cycling around like a, a bend um a slight bend in the road and there at the apex of the bend there was a side road um and I saw a van beginning to overtake another cyclist on the other side of the road um and I thought he was cutting it fine. I thought like, what is he doing? Mm. It's He doesn't have enough time to make it back to his side of the road. Um, but yeah, in, instead of going back to his side of the road, he continued on a racing line towards the side road at the apex. And he hit me head on at about 60, 70 kilometers an hour. I was going about 30. Um, and yeah, it was pretty catastrophic. I had really awful injuries. I um, shattered my patella. I damaged my patellar tendon. I ruptured completely my quadriceps tendon. I broke a chunk off my femur and I shattered my wrist. And I had like a lot of cuts and bruises and everything as well all over my body. I can imagine the, <clears throat> the, the pain of, of that and the, and the following weeks and months as well. Like, do you, what do you remember of the, the impact itself? Is it much or is it nothing? Or what's your, your memories of that moment? Uh, in that moment, I remember seeing the van coming towards me and I remember, first of all, thinking I'm about to die. Uh, and I remember f feeling that really strong. I'm about to die or I'm about to get really, really hurt. And then I just remember the the crack of hitting the, the windscreen because I shattered the whole windscreen. So I remember so clearly, like for, for weeks afterwards, I was waking up because I could just hear that that crack. It was such a loud noise. and. And then I just remember waking up on the, the side of the road and the first thing I was thinking was, I can't believe I'm alive. I, I said that sentence, like, I can't believe I'm alive because I thought so so clearly that I was going to die. Uh, it was a matter of a couple <laughs> of inches, two or three inches was probably the difference between yeah. survival and not. Yeah, for sure, because if you think about on the windscreen, there's like the pillar at the side mm. and I was just, you know, I'd say inches from hitting that pillar. And luckily I only hit the, the glass, but yeah, it was pretty, it was very close. It was like definitely a near death experience. It's not just like a term I can throw around. Like I really was so blessed to not die that day. So I remember you, you, I think you've spoken before, but the, and it's a phrase I hadn't heard before, the happiness watts, where, you know, a cyclist is in a moment of nirvana, they're having a great time, the, the, the speed is good. So funny enough, ironically enough on that cycle, you're having a pretty good cycle yeah. at the time. Yeah, yeah. No, I was I was way like I was about 20 watts higher than I needed to be in that moment. And I was like on that bike ride, I was just like, oh, God, my legs are feeling amazing. I, I was about to go next week. I was about to go off on a training camp with my new team. And I was thinking, like, oh, this is amazing. Like, I'm going to absolutely be flying this season. And then all of a sudden, yeah, it. Yeah, I was too. I, you know, it's funny because in that moment, I remember thinking like, and afterwards, I remember thinking, if I hadn't been going so well, I wouldn't have been there at that exact moment in time. Like, the stars all had to align for me to be there at that moment in time, for him to be there, for the other cyclists to be there. And and yeah, so I kind of really struggled afterwards. And, and maybe this sounds a bit airy-fairy, but like to, to think, what was the purpose of it happening? You know, and 
I think that's something you can only maybe relate to if you have like a near-death experience. You kind of do think like, why would this happen? And why am I still alive? Why am I here? And, and I read a lot about it, like people struggling, you know, to, to find their purpose or to realize what their purpose was after an accident like that. So it kind of sent me into a bit of a existential crisis for a while, yeah. What were the, what were the months there after? Like, I mean, I can imagine, as you say, there's surgeries, there's physio, there, there are probably sleepless nights and, and moments where you're having panic attacks and, and I guess recollections of what happened. So I can imagine those months thereafter were extremely difficult. Yeah, they were extremely difficult. And I think, <coughs> excuse me, I think because there was so much uncertainty, it was more difficult because I couldn't walk properly for the first three three months after the surgery. I had only 60 degrees range of motion in my legs. So I was thinking the whole time that I was there I was thinking like okay I'm making maybe one degree of progress in physio every day but I mean I want to cycle again like I want to be a professional cyclist I worked so hard for this and I, I just remember thinking like ha I wanted to I wanted it so badly but I remember going to a knee uh, consultant mm. in Belgium um, that was about three months afterwards and when I went into him and he sat me down and he said this is really bad and I remember like really having a panic attack there and then. I didn't even ask him, will I cycle again? I said like, will I walk again? Because I just didn't know what was ahead of me. And you know, I was so lucky this guy, he's one of the best knee surgeons that there is and a lot of cyclists go to him. And you know, he operated on my leg again and he, he actually found a piece of my bike still in my knee when he operated me three months later. There was so much scar tissue. I had been like hacked open basically. It was like really, I've got a massive scar on my knee. Um, and it was really, you know, I was really lucky to get to go to him to, because at that stage I had already said, okay, I will not cycle again in professional peloton. I had that, that hope that I would, but I didn't think I would. And I thought I would just, I thought I would go into paracycling. That was, I was already thinking, okay, I will not go back to my career. I cannot imagine cycling in the world tour of peloton again, but I will, still do something i will get back to competing in some capacity uh, did i read somewhere you you, you uh, utilized the uh, option of a hypnotist as well at, at different times like is that how did that help you or was that something that you found useful i'm sure people go to therapists and hypnotists and, and try every you, you're going to try anything as a professional cyclist to get back on the bike yeah the the hypnotherapy was more to deal with the fear that i had i i kind of I was really afraid of getting back on my bike. And I think when you, it's something, when you injure yourself so badly and then you put in so much work to get just back to a normal level of functioning, you can't imagine putting yourself into a scenario again where you'll hurt yourself again or where you potentially will hurt yourself again. And so I had that fear that I was in races, but I was thinking like, if I crash, I, oh, what about my knee? What about my wrist? Like I've worked so hard to get them back to this level. Will I you know, would I undo all of my hard work? And so I, I went to a hypnotherapist for that. And, you know, it might sound, again, a little bit airy-fairy, but actually that really helped me. I, I do listen to a lot of hypnosis to fall asleep and everything. Just, yeah, it's something I really believe in. Like, your subconscious mind is always taking things on. So I just try and bombard it with positivity. I'm sure family and friends come into that as well, and the people around you, like, for, for those number of months, and even up to now, I guess, having those people around you that you can sp speak to and talk to and, and help you get through it was so important. Yeah, for sure. And I made sure that everyone around me was very positive. I didn't allow people to like, I thought that was really important for me in my recovery was that I did not allow negativity to come into it. Mm. I remember like the first physio session I was able to go to, um, you know, I said to him, even if my knee is really bad, just tell me it's amazing because it's amazing. And the first time I went with the the doctor for the insurance company of the driver who you know I meant to tell him everything is so bad mm. I went into him and he was like your knee is very bad and I said no my knee is amazing <laughs> like it is going to be the best knee in the peloton <laughs> so I really like did not want to accept anything negative into my circle because I just thought yeah it's a shit sorry can I can, it's a course. shit enough situation as it is you know let let me try and at least control what I can control which is how I respond to it then what about the, the the system and 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 I guess the result of of an accident like this? So someone in a in a van hit you, as you say, was was coming around a corner, the wrong side of the road. Yeah. I think I just got their license maybe the the month before, mm -hmm. and what happened as well to to uh, 
Davide Rebidon, Rebid the, yeah. the the cyclist who was tragically killed in a in a eerily similar yeah. uh, crash. Um, I think the person that hit him had had been involved in a similar incident before, mm-hmm. fled the scene as well after the crash that killed Rebidon. Uh, what what do you want to see change or come out of this? Um, because when it comes to cyclists, and and it's the same on on, on the Dublin roads as well, cyclists are often seen as not not human. Uh, you yeah. forget the stories that these people have have families and lives of their own. You know, yeah. that's something I really spoke about in this ad campaign, and it was something I was really conscious that I wanted to bring forward. Like what I would like to change out of this is that somebody sees my story and slows down, and you know like you say there's this massive disconnect between drivers and cyclists and they don't see cyclists as humans they see them as obstacles in their way that they need to get past as quickly as possible but they forget how vulnerable we as cyclists feel on the road like we as cyclists we just want to get home alive and sorry if we're holding you up for five seconds for 10 seconds but these people have whole lives and and they're a person outside of that 10 seconds that they're holding you up and for me, I want to see that change. I want to see drivers looking at cyclists as humans and giving us the respect and the space that we need. It is so, it's scary when you're a cyclist on the road and it's not something, it's something we can change. All that you need to change is your attitude towards a cyclist and seeing them as a human. Like it's not, it's not a difficult thing when you put it in human terms like that. Um, that's really what I want to see change because I don't have the power to change something like, you know, the law. I can't change that. The guy who hit me, he never got a penalty point. He never got a fine, nothing. You know, he is, I've passed him driving on the road and that's horrific for me. And but the same guy since. Yeah, yeah. Actually, a mad story. I, my dad was visiting a couple of weeks ago and uh, we were on like an easy ride uh, and he, I was passing nearby the place where the accident happened. I said, Dad, will we go down to the place where it happened? And so my dad has all the pictures on his phone of like when he had gone to the scene a couple of days afterwards. So we went there and, uh, you know, I stood where I was standing when the van hit me and my dad like stood where the paint markings were on the road and we like measured the distance, how far my body had gone, blah, blah, blah. And as we were standing there, just like, at this junction in the road, a, a van came around the corner and I said to dad, like joking, oh, watch out, like, and it was the fucking guy no driving the car as I'm standing on the spot where he had left my body, do you know? What are the chances of that? Like, What are the chances? It was like a movie. It was just the most bizarre thing. And so like, you can imagine how traumatic that is. Like that, that really, I was crying like I could barely get home on the bike that was so traumatic for me and you know I can't control that he has no punishment I that's that's up to the law and I give it over to them but I can hopefully change the way that somebody might hear my story and might think okay that's a person on the road that's somebody who might have you know worked towards this for 10 years like I did worked towards getting professional contract or it's just somebody trying to get home from work and that's what I hope I can change that's insane and like uh, PTSD is a thing for a lot of people when it, when, when it comes to, to things like this and accidents like has it been easy for you in terms of getting back on a bike like I, I can imagine the first time for example you got back on a bike it was maybe traumatic certainly something mm-hmm. that, that triggers certain memories well I actually think I was so happy to be back on the bike that I don't know if it was traumatic I remember I got back on the bike and after like 20 meters I unclipped because I was in the cleats and I unclipped and I was like, oh my God, I was crying. I was really afraid. But actually, I don't think I've experienced as much PTSD on the bike, you know, probably off the bike if I'm watching my story back or if I'm thinking this time a year ago I couldn't walk, then it's quite difficult for me. But actually on the bike, I don't feel it as much. I'm definitely more afraid in the peloton, like when I'm when I'm racing. Um, but I'm thinking that's something that will just come back with time. Uh, and I'm more I'm more vocal, I think, towards mm. drivers. Like in the past, I might not have had the same, um, I might have had the same caution. No, I was very cautious before, but I might not have been as vocal about like, please give me space. Whereas mm. if somebody comes into my space now, I'll be like, oh, sorry, I'm about to curse again. Yeah, what the fuck? <laughs> like, you know, I'll be really annoyed that somebody will in- encroach on me. And, and I think that, uh, not that we have to do that as cyclists, because definitely I, I try, you know, if somebody's nice to me, I will always give them the salute, like, thank you. But I think as well, like, 
it's because I'm afraid. And sometimes I might like overreact. Like I remember a woman like pulled out, like reverse quickly out of her drive and, and nearly hit me a few months ago and I lost it. And, and if somebody <clears throat> had been recording me in that moment, I would have been so embarrassed. But when I got like a hundred meters further down the road, I just burst into tears because it's because I'm afraid. And the thing is like, you don't know as a driver what cyclists have gone through before. Maybe there's somebody like me out on the road. So if you're beeping at them, if you're shouting at them out the window, like maybe they have PTSD as well. Um, and so, yeah, it's just, there just needs to be more empathy, please. <laughs> it's not much to ask really yeah. when you think about it. Um, and texting while driving is another thing. And, and like we see the sign for the cycle safety campaign launched behind you. And uh, that's one issue that I think a lot of cyclists bring up quite commonly mm. because as you say like if someone looks at their phone for even all, all of 5 10 15 seconds mm. that could be fatal yeah yeah exactly like it's just that lapse in concentration um and i don't know whether the guy who hit me was driving or was texting while driving but yeah it's just you especially if you're driving in a built-up area i mean at all times you should not be on your phone but if you're driving somewhere like dublin or galway or limerick or wherever cork like you don't have you don't have that uh, that moment where you can control your speed like you, if you're letting it go for five seconds you're you're missing out on a moment where cyclists could have to avoid a pothole or you know I, I know I sound like I'm harping on and I know that people are probably sick of me doing this because I'm on social media I post about it all the time like safe driving blah 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 but it is something I feel so passionately about like because I am so vulnerable on the road and I just want to get home alive like I don't uh, I just don't know why it's something I should have to worry about, you know, is if is somebody going to kill me today? Mm. You know, it's my job to go out and train. I have to train every day, but it's very scary to do it sometimes. You're clearly someone who's embraced this role, like you've been thrust into it as a result of what happened, but you, you, you wear the role of ambassador remarkably well, like you speak so eloquently about it as well, which is, which is amazing, but you probably don't even realise the impact it could have on on drivers who maybe don't think of cyclists or maybe do think of cyclists and, and just dislike them for whatever reason. Mm. So do, I guess the question is, do you realize the, 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 the impact that maybe you're having? I don't realize it, but I hope I am. Uh, and I think what it is, is seeing somebody young, like people think of cyclists, they think male, middle age, maybe. I'm a young female, well, young, I'm, I'm nearly 30. I'm nearly 30 as well, so that, that, is, that is young, I'm very young. young. <laughs> um, I'm a very young female cyclist, and, you know, I'm, uh, you know, it can happen to me. I'm a professional. I think maybe some people think people get hit by a car, and it's because, oh, they were, like, doddering about on the road, and they weren't paying attention. I was doing my job. I was on my side of the road. I was not breaking any rules of the road. And I'm a young, fit person, and I was hit and could have died, Do you know. And I think that we're used to to seeing cyclists as older males, but if somebody sees my story and like they think, oh yeah, okay, it can happen to anybody. That that's what I hope um, can come from it. But yeah, I hope I'm. I hope I can do this role well. I hope I can change something or slow one person down. Uh, that would for me. That I think that's why. You know, I spoke about your purpose in life. I think that's what what I was kept here for, maybe. You know, maybe my story can change something. What does the tattoo say again? You said you have a tattoo. Yeah. I got Am I allowed to reveal that? <laughs> I got a tattoo. It was a tattoo I'd wanted for ages, and I got it just after my accident. Um, I got miles to go in my dad's writing and before I sleep in my mum's. Uh, oh, cute. That is very cute, cute to be fair. <laughs> yeah, no, it's from a Robert Frost poem. And, yeah, lots to achieve before I die, I guess, is... It's a perfect way to, to, I guess, wrap with the question because we have the benefit of being able to ask you about your cycling ambitions now because I know, like, I think 2017 it was when you first started getting into cycling properly. Yeah. Um, so what are the ambitions now that you can compete again, you can get back on the bike? You're living in Barcelona at the moment, so what's the, what's, what's the plan for the next three to five years, I guess? Well, my goal is to go world tour. Um, I want to get to the highest level of team that I can. Um, I want to go to the Europeans and the world and represent Ireland. Um, but you know, there's another cyclist, uh, Bernal. I don't know if you know mm -hmm. him, but he was uh, he was hit two days before me. He was hit by a car, and I remember reading his and, and thinking, "Oh my God, I can't believe it's happened to Bernal." And now I see him back in the World Tour peloton. It's very motivating for me. But he said, like, 
if I don't win any other races, I've won the race for life. And that's something that I feel like when I read that line, I was like, yeah, I'm still so driven to do my job and I still have so much I want to achieve. But I'm also very aware that my life took a different path at the time where it was all going in an upward trajectory with cycling. I was, you know, going to be a great cyclist that year and and my path got changed without my control. But um, I'm back competing. I'm very happy about that. And I still have big goals, but I'm also very aware that like I have won a massive race for life. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. On that note, uh, keep Keep racing the race for life. It's been brilliant uh, chatting to you, Imogen, and, and you're you're a wonderful ambassador for what you do as well. Um, so yeah, keep 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 at it and uh, keep fighting the good fight. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Good stuff.